Hi, it's Mark Cooper Smith of UC Berkeley, and I am really pleased to be spending some time online right now with Edith Young. Hi, Edith. Hi, Mark. How are you? Good. You love, you love the background music. This is sort of the intro music is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> So Edith is a longtime friend. She has uh, joined me um, with many of our entrepreneurship uh, programs, uh, executive education at UC Berkeley, international, uh, kind of providing coaching and insights as to what investors look for. Um, she is a venture investor with her own firm, Race Capital, and she is also an expert on China, and in particular, China internet types of technologies. Uh, she just came out with the 2020 version of the China internet report. Edith, which edition is this? Is this four, three, four, five? Uh, this year number four. Year number four of the China internet report. And in our recorded session today, Edith is gonna share with us some highlights and maybe some takeaways, things for, things for us to look for um, when we take a look at what's happening in China, in Asia, and China, US as well. So Edith, first of all, thanks for spending some time together with us. Yeah, thank you for having me, Mark. Yeah. Uh, very ha happy to be here. Um, so yeah, so maybe give you guys a quick summary of the China Internet Report 2020. Um, so the origin of this report is, you know, for the last 10 years, I've been going back and forth between China and US and many of my friends often ask me, hey, how's the China? How's it going in China? And I often have to explain hours and hours of things that I learned from there. And so the intent for the China Internet Report um, is really about sharing learnings and um, China sometimes is interesting. It could be scary at times. Uh, but there's a lot of really interesting, particularly in the technology and trends that I think we from the West can also learn from. So the intent of this is really about help demystify what's happening in China, particularly in the internet space. So this year, we, um, the report itself, which uh, the, the, there's an addition, a free edition that you can go on and download. I'm sure Mark, you will share the link. I will. Um, and there's also... The report itself captured about 10 or 13 of this particular industry. Let's say if you're really into fintech, we go into what are the important trends, uh, what venture capitalists are most active investing in, in each of these verticals, and some of the most top funded uh, company for each vertical. But we also start a report with what are some of the latest trends. Um, so I do want to touch on maybe two or three, I think is really interesting um, to point out. And if it's okay, uh, Mark, I want to quickly uh, share screen. Let's Perfect. See As you're getting ready to share screen, um, you come at this from a couple of points of view, right? You come at this by trying almost like, like an analyst to say what's going on in China, but you're also an investor. You invest in China, you invest in the US. So I presume you're also looking for those kinds of trends that are going to help inform intelligent investments as well. Is that right? That's right. I, I think my point of view is always coming from a investor point of view. So as an early stage investor, uh, I really want to understand what are some of the latest trends um, that we should be aware of um, in terms of investment, but also need to understand what are some of like the constraints um, and also public markets. So uh, this is this year report. I just want to quickly uh, show, show you guys like some of the really in, in interesting stati statistics for us to look at. China essentially, regardless, is the population is about one point, almost 1.4 billion. The internet population is about 900 million. So the stat itself is three times the size of the U.S. populations. And then you, if you look at mobile and mobile payment population, uh, which also have very, very high penetration rate, is again is like two or two and a half times the size of the U.S. population. Is that's why so many. Uh, American companies like the Apple, Microsoft, uh, Google of the world all want to get into this particular market. Yeah, One um, of the things for me that I always found interesting, and it, I'll go back a few years, whenever I had groups from China that were visiting the United States that were coming to UC Berkeley or, or various programs, they already were basically living mobile first, everything was digital, payments were digital, and when we were just adopting things like Android Pay and Apple Pay and all the other Samsung Pay, they were kind of looking at us going, 
why don't you have this everywhere? So I guess my first question, if we want to go back a couple of years and then right back to here, was it Greenfield? Why was it adopted so broadly, so quickly in China in particular? Things like payments. That's a great question. If I go back to this slide, you're talking about 800, 900 um, in terms of adoption for mobile payment. Particularly for mobile payment, uh, there's two major players uh, in China, obviously one is M Financial, which is a spin-off from Alibaba, mm-hmm. uh, which is going to go public soon, but not in the U.S. Um, they take a little, almost I would say between 50 to 60 percent of the market share, and then the rest is uh, mainly by uh, WeChat Pay, which is right. um, the product by Tencent. And I have to say, just to start with, China net the credit card penetration is really, really low. Like if you're talking about the US always been super convenient, there's no strong pain point right. um, to have to have you know mobile pay until COVID. Uh, before that, credit card is certainly working fine pretty much nationwide in the US, but that is not the case in China. China up till maybe 15, 10 years ago. Up till now, it's still only single digit million, maybe a few million in terms of credit card. Majority of the Chinese population have no credit card. Right. So, so therefore it was pretty, it started with nothing, right? So there's no legacy system to be replaced and there's no special POS system where they need to adopt. So in, in that sense, um, it's almost easier for for most of the small businesses, and and we're not talking about people who really uh, the deep tech or high right. tech, not at all. In fact, uh, if you go to China now, now pretty much COVID is lifted. Lifted, you see like beggar on the street. They don't even want your cash. They just put out a QR code, a piece of paper, on the ground, and say, like, "Don't give me real money." Just like give me like over over WeChat Pay or Alipay. Right. It's, it's that popular because right. everybody accepted and, and people are just really, really comfortable with it. Yeah. Well, and what's interesting is, I mean, here in the United States, presuming and in Europe, we all had our physical wallets that were filled with credit cards. So we had all sorts of alternative ways to pay, but that didn't exist in China. So the advent of the digital wallet basically was very greenfield and adoption was amazingly, amazingly fast. For me, there's a takeaway and then right back to you. And the takeaway is if there aren't, if there's nothing in the way, if there's not an entrenched system that you have to replace, the adoption of new technologies can go really quickly. Once you have that entrenched system, then it gets much harder. And we've seen that with adoption of electronic payments in the US because we still all have our credit cards. Now our digital wallets are basically ways to connect our credit cards or our bank accounts to those anyway. So it's not a digital first perspective. Anyway, please go ahead. That's right. And, and then on, on that note, um, since I bring up Alibaba and Financial and Tencent are the two major players in the mobile payment space, I want to jump into um, this particular page. I don't want to go into details, but I do want to point out that um, unlike the U.S., you know, U.S. usually you have um, the FANG, right? So there is the Facebook, Google, Apple, Netflix, Amazon. Right. And in the BAT, which is we used to say Baidu is the Google of China. Unfortunately, Baidu is actually not that strong of an internet player anymore in China. They don't, they're not even top 10 uh, in terms of the largest player in China. They're number 11. Hmm. Um, and I, the only reason why I bring up this particular slide is um, look at number two and number three. They're both really Alibaba and M Financial going public very, very soon. And this particular chart, I want to point out two things. One is, um, if you look at all of these internet companies, except uh, Pinduoduo number six, which is listed on the NASDAQ, every single one of these companies are either dual listing uh, or only list in in Hong Kong or or China. Um, This is something that is is a trend that started last year because of the US-China tension. Um, and there's a lot of turmoil going back and forth with some of the listing um, right. that's happening in the U.S. So I think going forward, it will be a trend where most of the Chinese company will f- think twice. But before, you know, 10 years ago, is even like Chinese entrepreneur, tech entrepreneur particularly, to be able to get 
an exit and IPO in the US is really the ultimate tech entrepreneur American dream. Right. Um, and what you're seeing here is, is slowly, um, there is definitely a divide. Right. But having said that, as an investor, this particular slide, we, uh, we did a lot of research on who invested in some of the largest company in China. And you can see a lot of familiar names like SoftBank, Sequoia Capital, uh, DST from URI, uh, GIC from Singapore, Lightspeed. There's a lot of really familiar names that yeah. we, we know household name in the U.S. There are also household investors um, in China and, and that will continue. Um, unfortunately, the other way around is not so much because of CVS, um, which the U.S. government is blocking quite a bit of investment from China over here. But the other way around is not so much because this ecosystem, particularly for venture capital, um, U.S. investing in China has been going on for the last 15, 20 years. Right. So, well, how much of how much of this as well is a growth in several things that are going on in the Chinese economy? I mean, the the increasing growth of the middle class from an investing perspective, uh, increased uh, sophistication of some of the financial markets in China, and access as they've all gone digital I and mean, things like that. How how much of and a focus on their own domestic markets, which. COVID in some ways has actually accelerated both for consumption, but also raising capital. I mean, how much are those types of trends, and there may be some others you would highlight, also important in addition to some of the friction that continues to take place between US and China? That is a great question, which leads me into this particular slide about Huawei. Mm -hmm. um, Huawei is definitely the, the example uh, in terms of how how they're slowly shifting, um, because I mean, obviously they're not operating in the U.S., but right. but because of the sanction, um, there is more scrutiny with they operating overseas. So this particular slide you see, like they just basically even in the last you know eighteen months, they're shifting a lot of their revenue um, is actually increasing for fifty two percent. Uh, to 59% is mostly domestic market for, for Huawei. Right. Um, and because they're getting involved in so many countries, I think there's more and more of not only from a market, uh, really focus on domestic because, you know, frankly, China uh, as a market, a, a very, very high adoption rate for technology just itself is two or three times the size of the US. Right. So in that sense, it's okay. It, they're, they're fine <laughs> in terms of survival. Um, but more importantly, um, there's still, I, I think China is still quite lagged behind, uh, as, uh, particularly in the se semiconductor space. Um, this particular slide also talk about the increase of R&D and how essentially if you think about it, there's a lot of the particular for mobile um, components um, is still heavily relying on companies like Qualcomm, Intel, Micron, NVIDIA. And if on a daily basis, the, the U.S. government is blogging some of these companies to sell to Chinese companies like Huawei, um, I think this shift of less reliance of outside, but more self-reliant on, on your own technology and also your own market growth um, is something that all Chinese companies are thinking about and preparing for the worst. Right. Well, as we take a look at the growth of Chinese domestic marketplace and compare that against not just the U.S., but U.S. and Europe combined, which have typically been the two largest markets, the Chinese domestic market is now as big as, or if not exceeding or soon will, that, com that combined marketplace of U.S. and Europe, right? Yeah, very, very much so. Having said that, you know, obviously, just like U.S. have very, very large ambition, um, it's always been sort of following the U.S. rule. Um, China have its own ambition and they don't hide it. Right. Um, but unfortunately, now when two, two big countries fight, um, I felt like, you know, we are, we are, I can't wait to be able to travel freely in both sides. Um, but it's just happening now. So yeah. it is what it is. It's something that we just need to be aware of as an investor and also as a, as a founder and entrepreneur. Right. Well, and, and as an aside, for those who don't know you, I'll, you know, I'll say you're, you know, you are originally, you know, your folks live in Hong Kong. That's where you're from. And, um, of course you've lived in the States for a long time. So you're very much in the middle of that fight. You live it all the time, right? Yeah. I, I'm the last person that I don't want to see my parents fight. Yeah. And, and uh, 
this is not, is not pretty. And um, although having said that, to, to shift this whole fight conversation, um, there is so much similarity. And I'm going to show you a, a last slide and then we can have more conversation just, just us. Mm -hmm. um, the last slide, which is really about the similarity. Um, I, I think, Mark, you and I cannot stop talking about COVID. This is probably will be the top of any conversation um, regardless of where you go in the world. Yeah. And, and I wanted to point out the similarity is that we're all going through a tough time. And as the impact of COVID for the China tech sector, it also is almost, I think th um, the US is about three months delay in terms of financial market and also technology market impact. But you can see um, what's really interesting, obviously work productivity um, app applications, this is for mobile uh, and for desktop, have increased tremendously, 242%. And that is exactly the same case uh, for the US as well. Um, a lot more use of web browser. Uh, it's pretty much like video is a big winner um, in terms of taking advantage of uh, what's going on with the pandemic. And then um, online education. Mark, I mean, I can't wait to see you face to face, but um, but I only have seen you over this little box over Zoom for the last half a year. So yeah, we're kind of living in these boxes, right? So 100% growth there. Uh, why do you think such a big growth in video editing, not as big a category? Um, I mean, I would have my own presumptions. Why is that? Um, I think I think most. Uh, it's interesting. China is actually really big on uh, short video. Um, right. A lot of them actually quite comfortable with doing live. Uh, so like, the only time they would do video editing is when they really wanted to make it super nice and not live streaming. Um, but if you sort of compare short video, even before the pandemic is huge. Um, it's basically they're running on mostly the number one is the TikTok of China, which is right. called Douyin, um, essentially owned by the same company called ByteDance. Right. And, um, and that's been a huge phenomenon. And I kind of jokingly, um, I, before I came back to the U.S. earlier this year, I was asking one of my friend's um, son, he's, he's 16 years old, and I asked him, so um, your dad is not here. You can tell me how much time you spent on Douyin, uh, basically TikTok of China. And, and I said, is it four hours? He's like, more. Every day, right. I'm like, six? Yeah, every day. Yeah. More. So essentially, like they, they fall asleep with, with it right. and they wake up with it and constantly, at least like eight hours a day. Yeah. Um, that's how crazy it is. And, and I think a lot of um, our, our young, young youth in the U.S. is also following, following that trend as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. So what do you think this means? Let's, let's step back to some of the broader trends. So there's a number of things that came out of that report, whether you want to kind of bring those together as far as some themes, but what are some of the implications? You know, we have, this is the year of COVID. Um, what do you, what does it accelerate the most? You know, we've talked about work productivity. Um, is it e-commerce? Is it remote workplace? What are you seeing? Yeah. So I, um, I wanted to draw a little bit history lesson that we learned particularly from China is, you know, Alibaba seems like a huge giant, but that now, but 17 years ago, they were not. And in fact, the last um, pandemic similar to COVID in China was SARS. Um, it never really made it to the U.S., so nobody really talked too much about it here, but it was a huge deal. It was a huge deal for Hong Kong. Many, many It started in Hong Kong and well, a lot of people die in the same building because of it, it's just a very, very dense place. Right. And that's why most people in Asia are really scared um, because it happened 17 years before. Correct. It go, so at the time, no one wanted to go outside. Um, and it really, really kicked off business for Alibaba because Alibaba fractured product is uh, Taobao and Tmall essentially mm -hmm. is the Amazon uh, right. Of, of back then, but they were just starting. And because of that, um, they were all working from home, but everybody was ordering online because they can't go outside and shop. So essentially e-commerce is, was, became a thing because of SARS. Um, so now um, China and US in some sense, I think, thank God, like we have 
uh, Amazon Prime and you know we have Uber Eats and we have Postmates and um, we're not suffering. And I, I have not, I don't, I miss going out, but I'm alive mm -hmm. and, and purely just everything delivery. So, and US and, and China, both e-commerce and, and just look at M Amazon stock price. Um, and also particularly in the US, look at Shopify. So, which is really the backbone e-commerce infrastructure for small businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, both doing really, really well. So I think both countries are actually quite similar, um, but obviously have their own version of it. I think that's doing amazing. Well, you, uh, said, you said something earlier, which was interesting, that Baidu is no longer you know, quite in the same place where it used to be. I often take a look at kind of our big four or five or the FANG index. And if we went back six months ago, Google, Amazon, Apple, they all were trading in kind of the same range around a trillion dollars in market cap. Well, Amazon, Apple recently passed two trillion. Amazon is close to two trillion. Google's still trading around a trillion dollars in market cap. So, there has been some separation on things from like Amazon. Uh, as we take a look at that, I saw JD.com also as one of the top uh, companies on your list. When we take a look at what's going on in e-commerce, those companies have really become essential. Um, in a different way. They occupy a bigger part of our lives. And as a result, the market caps really seem to reflect that. Yeah, and, and that, and also I wanted to point out one thing is both Apple, and of course, you know, I'm drawing a lot of China learning to what we're seeing here. Yeah. And I often made the statement that if you want to understand the future of FinTech, just go to China, starting with mobile payment. Yeah. But more importantly, um, if you look at the movement, particularly for Amazon and Apple, um, Apple um, did a partnership last year with Goldman Sachs. They're doing really, really well with their uh, with Apple Pay, and also now I have an Apple uh, Apple credit card supported by Go uh, by Goldman. Um, you, you're tr slowly they also get into like fintech and. Mm -hmm. Uh, Google overall, very similar to Baidu, both, both companies are still relying on mainly advertising. And with COVID, with any sort of pandemic and crisis, usually advertising spent goes down. So, uh, but don't get me wrong, like, these are still amazing companies. Um, but having said that, if you look at Amazon's, very similar thing, like they, they are actually looking into potential loans for all their merchants. Yep. It's very, very Alibaba playbook. And what Alibaba have done is with spin off with and financial and financial really like the number one revenue is not like they don't actually take a cut from mobile payment and um, most because it's mostly peer to peer is really all the wealth management uh, financial product. They basically operate like the world largest, what do you call it, like funds um, because of all the investment product that they offer. Um, well, and if you take a look at, at Ant and Alibaba together, that's close to a trillion dollar market cap right there, right? And there's room for growth as they look to go public and, and, and continue to grow. That's right. And um, as a private company, Ant Financial is the largest the like most valuable private company, their last round valuation was 150 billion. Yeah. Um, their latest public events is gonna happen in both Shanghai, this Shanghai uh, Tech Board and also Hong Kong Stock Exchange and then estimate maybe 200 billion. So who knows, um, is, is uh, really interesting to see. But if you take a look at what they're doing versus PayPal, um, there's definitely room to grow. What are, what are some things, I mean, one of the things that you just shared with us is if you want to look at the future of financial services, um, especially digital financial services, look to China. Um, what are some of the things, you know, China's ahead of us when it comes to the way that it's handled COVID-19. It's ahead of us on the move to digital wallet. It's ahead of us in a number, when I say us, I mean the U.S. or the Western markets. Um, uh, so it's interesting how China has kind of leapfrogged at least certain parts of, of Western society. When we take a look at the next three, six, 12 months here in the U.S. and in Europe, are there some takeaways from what you're seeing in China that you would want to highlight for us as far as what we might expect? I mean, it's hard to tell the future, but kind of tugging mm -hmm. on that thread a little bit more, what are you seeing there that we might look for? Um, I think to start since we're on the topic of like fintech, 
um, China actually, uh, President Xi have announced that they are going to launch their own digital currency, uh, November 2019. And actually, I was, I spoke on CNBC on just a prediction uh, at the time that they they will roll out officially um, the DCEP, which is their digital currency, um, in the next 12 months. And so even with COVID. Um, they actually already started rolling out some some of the uh, pilot program. Uh, and, and by the way, is that going to be supported by some of the underlying tech that you would think it was like blockchain technology or how is that going to work? Yes, it's a blockchain technology right. uh, that they're building upon. Although I, I mean, as much as I am, I, I'm an admirer of what's going on in China, I'm also a big critic at the same time, which is, uh, blockchain technology is really all about um, decentralization. There is no decentralization in right. anything in China, and um, everything. Well, it's, more of a, it's more of a digital ledger more than anything else, right? If you look at it that way, but still, it does exist. So, um, yeah, yeah. yes, but there is not decentralized. No, I, I mean, I mean, it's kind of like it's not really decentralized in that way. So, it's not a f fundamentally a true blockchain technology if it all exists as centralized as as it seems to be implied. Well, well, uh, so in this case, uh, the, the rolled out, and, and they have actually publicly announced, like they partner with all the major banks in China, and of course, including Alibaba, Tencent, mm -hmm. with the two very, very large um, mobile payment user base. So to, for them to roll this out is really well thought through. Um, definitely give them a lot of credit for that. But you can imagine, this is quite opposite of decentralization. In fact, is all about like now there's no if they really roll this out to the whole country th there will no longer be any money laundering ever again because you, you will literally know every single little pennies that's being moved um from mark you sent me a hundred dollars rmb um no one uh, will be behind in the dark every right. everything will be accessible uh, by all these major banks and players and chinese government so um, this is definitely coming and is a partially small rollout, but it is um, something that I think China have done a really sort of like hands-on top-down approach to push for these certain technology. Okay, so that's really interesting. So if we take a look, pretty much, you know, everybody with reasonable spending power uh, in China has a digital wallet. It's yeah. likely we're going to be moving to very much a digital currency all sorts of implications. Do we? Do you think that's going to be happening soon in the West? How how far behind do you think it is? And do you have any idea who might be an early adopter? Has anybody started to signal, or is there a wait and see? Well, I, I make fun of the fact that when President Xi announced um, the launch of the Chinese own digital currency, yeah. it was one week after Mark Zuckerberg uh, went to the Congress and get give to testify uh, to defend the launch of Libra, which right. is the Facebook. Um, a cryptocurrency and i think technically libra is wow like i've always been very impressed by the team of facebook but unfortunately with the way that they've been rolling it out um, which i am a big critic of which they basically went around the world and trying to convince these various different governments and their central bank to adopt a a programmable uh, decentralized currency that is controlled by an American company. Mm, I don't think that is going to fly. And in fact, um, last year I did quite a bit of traveling to certain countries and also talked to some of the central bank. And their response is not about technology. When you're talking about currency, is really about right. econo economy and thinking about currency control. There's no government in the world would allow an American company to freely provide to let their citizens to transfer their own local currency to a digital currency to convert it back to US dollar without their own knowing. This is just not happening, guys. And, um, but there's something that- so, so, so to Mark Zuckerberg and team, nice try, but you don't see this happening, right? I, I, I admire their technology right. chop and know-how, but I think this is, not, this is not one of those activities that you can you know, move fast and break things. Right. You will get a lot of government fighting against you when you're trying to break the currency control. So digital currency, interesting. 
and it, if I'm kind of reading between, will happen, but it'll take a little bit longer and everybody is really going to need to launch their own, similar to the way that China has already announced it. And of course, they're not going to entrust Mark Zuckerberg and team to, uh, to launch their digital currency. Obviously, it's going to be a Chinese-owned enterprise or a Chinese uh, initiative that's going to do that, right? That's right. And uh, um, Mark, since we're on this topic about China and technology companies, I uh, read a really well-written article that was written in actually 1996, I think it's very old, by David Kilpatrick, uh, used to write for Fortune. He traveled to China with Bill Gates. This is many, many years ago. Um, and at the time, Microsoft were not getting a lot of headways. But, but many years later, you know, Microsoft and Bill Gates were basically the hero um, you know, of, of America and have done really, really well in China. And in that article, they actually talk about how um, they, it's very on Microsoft, like they let the Chinese government, they want the Chinese government to use Microsoft and the same response, Chinese government, are you going to spy on us? This is American software. And they actually let them audit some of their source code and actually um, adjust a lot of the pricing to make it more, you know, China. Mm -hmm. um, and Microsoft software is being used by every single government agencies and most of majority of a Chinese enterprise is very successful. And it, that's been going on for 20 plus years. So, so what's the take, what's your takeaway from that? I mean, that was obviously a brilliant move on the part of Microsoft to bake themselves in. The takeaway, given the mutual distrust, say, between China and the U.S. and our key companies creates that, creates challenges. How do we navigate that in the same way that Microsoft did? Um, I recently wrote an op-ed on for South China Morning Post, which is, I really mean it. Like I'm in the U.S. not because, you know, obviously America is why the world respect U.S. is it's always been sort of the one that is the righteous one, like to protect what is, what is, what is right. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I think instead of trying to fight and you know force TikTok to be bought by some American company, it's really about regulation, um, audit. Let's put in the right framework in place to defend American reputation, being sort of embrace global internet. And of course, there's always rule of law and check and balance, but to force like an and an and a M and A and like want to get a cut of the fee. That is just not something that America is all about. America is about defending open internet. And I think sort of what China did to Microsoft, um, in fact, I think U.S. government should do the same thing, which is audit, um, making sure that maybe, you know, let us review your code, uh, make sure that, you know, there are very good check and balance so that you operate it under our, con our framework. And I think we need to respect for both sides. We have different rules. And, and uh, I look forward to the day that where U.S. really embrace global internet and put some rules and regulations. Uh, to so it's help. both a combination of rules and regulations that we can agree with on both sides, but it's also opening up our technology platforms and providing that transparency to allow the sides to be able to collaborate without fearing that there's kind of a Trojan horse embedded in that. And I think that's was kind of one of the lessons or, that we can take away from that Microsoft deal. That's right. And, and it's not a zero sum game. And if you talk to a lot of the major players that have done well in, in China, they want to do business there. And mm -hmm. they know that, yes, obviously, China have some of the best, not so good practice around IP that definitely need to be improved. And there's a lot of things that sometimes is like, what? But I think they, they are learning and aware they need to improve. And the different things is, you know, America is, mm -hmm. if you ask a lot of the tech players, they still want to play there. Right. Um, no one want to give us such a large market. So as we wrap up in the next couple of minutes, just are there one or two other kind of key trends or key themes that came out of the China Internet Report, this latest, uh, this latest edition, that you would want to highlight for us and kind of what it means for us? Yeah, so my, my one final takeaway is, um, and that's why I'm super bullish on um, very specifically on anything that's enterprise infrastructure, 
Um, we're in a really strange time with the pandemic. And Mark, I can't wait to meet you in person um, and do face-to-face -face meeting. Yeah. Having said that, worldwide, regardless it's China or US, but of, co of course, a little bit te different technology stack. Um, w w this whole work from home, um, work infrastructure is won't go away. And in fact, no business in the world will ever let this happen to them again. Right. So therefore around um, collaboration, video infrastructure, security, data privacy, any sort of communication related enterprise infrastructure, there will be a lot of many, many interesting startups um, that will spring up to, to support this regardless it's large enterprise or small businesses. Um, digitalization, everybody talks about it forever, but now traditional businesses, they, they are forced to do this. This is agenda item number one. Um, and as a VC, I'm super excited about that and that applies to worldwide. And for now, China, US have different technology stack and we look forward to learning more and investing in some of those companies. Yeah, so, so kind of wrapping up with what it means for you as a VC, Race Capital, you mentioned the areas that you're really excited about, which is kind of you know, the plumbing, the, the infrastructure of what it takes to be able to migrate. Um, COVID has done more than an army of McKinsey consultants ever could to accelerate the digitization, not just of the enterprise, but of the way that we communicate, just like you and I are right now. Um, so when, when you look at those sectors, I mean, you, you just mentioned a few, um, any in particular, is it your work from home, you know, video for, let, let me pause for a minute before I turn it over. Video is a great example. We've all migrated to Zoom. We're recording this on Zoom, but in the midst of a program that I'm running uh, just a few days ago, we had a worldwide Zoom outage and all of a sudden we all had to kind of push the reset button and then figure out how to get back. So thank, thankfully we were all on WhatsApp as well and we were able to deal with it that way. Uh, but kind of key takeaways, set key underlying sectors where you're looking to invest in anything in particular out of that. Yeah, we, we um, it's mainly enterprise infrastructure, but we also aware of different industry. You may have a very specific, let's say, um, for anything related to healthcare, it needs to be HIPAA compliance. Um, and then for education, you certainly, as much as I like Zoom, I think, I think this, uh, I actually, I have, um, it's, it's, it's the worst time, but also this definitely the best time. I have a company when IPO end of June, and then the name of the company is called Agora.io. And uh, most of the customers are actually in China. So essentially, they Zoom as a service. So uh, most of their customers are, um, education, healthcare, online dating, shopping, customer service, uh, but is basically Zoom, but embed in their own app. Right. So as you can imagine, I think this particular trend is here to stay, but not everyone necessarily wanted to have our video or data sitting on somebody else's server uh, or somebody else's control. Right. So in that sense, I think that there will be more and more of like the Agora type um, that have done amazingly well um, and they will continue to grow. So, so we're very excited about that, but I could see more niche and vertical um, players uh, just because of compliance and rules and regulations. Right, right. And some of the international players we work with, as much as we all are used to things as a service, they're very concerned about their own data and they're actually bringing some of their data back inside their firewalls. And then they're looking for the ability to integrate that with services that they can layer on top, but, but not let that data outside. So yeah. lots of different flavors involved. Yeah. Edith, where can we find, and at the end of this, I'll go ahead and put the, the URL and the link to this, but where can we find the China internet report? Um, the China Internet Report this year is uh, on the scmp.com uh, and uh, slash China Internet Report. You guys will find it and it's a great report. I want to thank the South China Morning Post team uh, put in so much effort. Now it's become a collaboration with their team and I'm very, very excited about this year's report. Um, it's over 130 some pages. So enjoy for your bedtime reading. So there's a lot there and at least we've got a little bit of an introduction to it as well. Edith. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark.